so let's get started. I want to welcome everybody to Poets in Conversation. And today we have Anastasia Vasos and Eileen Cleary. Um, and um, what we're, go we're going to be hearing about um, Greek statues, among a lot of other things, and um, grief counseling with John Keats, among a lot of other things as well. So um, uh, I've been falling in love with uh, both of these authors um, through their books, and um, I think you will too. Oh, and the first thing that I'm going to do now is read one of my poems. And um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about it. So it's not in my book. Um, and I don't even have my book here to hold it up and show you. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so so this this poem is something that I wrote. Um, I, I have a I have a small writing group that I lead, which is a therapeutic writing group. And um, uh, we get together about once a month and um, I pick a poem and then we use that as a writing prompt. So, so the poem that I picked for this particular month is a wonderful poem uh, called um, The Work of the Poet is to Name What is Holy by Diane Ackerman. So if you're not familiar with that, it's a wonderful, wonderful poem. Um, and um, so I got just got thinking about the work of a poet and, uh, and it came to me somehow the coat of a poet. So I wrote this poem. It's called Incantation. Incantation. The coat of a poet is patchworked, warm, full enough to fit everyone inside. We rest together in its tent of permissions and omissions, admissions, intuitions, paisley confessions. This inviolate space, this human errored space. We are fledglings huddled in its skyscrapered air, smell of planets of earth musk. Listen to the banter of spring as she loosens her leaf-felted robes. Birds flicker all around, moles dig in. Beneath this coat, we, it, we eat chocolate dipped in more chocolate. Sweetness spills, drops of honey fold into spiced tea to soothe our plaid misfortunes. The coat of a poet has seams for fears, tears, for blisses, kisses of silk on skin. It breezes smoke out of its pockets and into a glossy night. When we sleep, it's a love or a friend rests on a hook. If sleep is outside the window, it's our weighted blanket. Morning comes wearing woolly sunlight lightly around its shoulders. Thank you. So I'm now I'm going to introduce Eileen. Um, so here it goes. Eileen Cleary is the author of Child Ward of the Commonwealth which was published by Main Street Rag in 19, 2019 and received an honorable mention for the Sheila Margaret Motten Book Prize. And she's also published 2 a.m. with Keats with, uh, on, with Nix's Mate Publishing just this year. Um, she co-edited the anthology Voices Amidst the Virus, which was featured text at 2021 Michigan State University Film, Filmetry Festival. Um, she's had a lot of publications in various journals. I'll just name a few, Sugar House Review, West Texas Literary Review, American Journal of Poetry, and Solstice. Um, and she also founded and edits the Lily Poetry Review and the Lily Poetry Review of Books. And she curates the Lily Poetry Salon. The other thing 
to know about Eileen is that she works as a hospice nurse. And it seems to me from just beginning to get to know Eileen that this really uh, infuses everything about her life. Um, she told us that someday she'd like to write a children's book. And um, she and Anastasia, our other reader, became friends through poetry workshops and also the Lily Poetry Review. Um, and I saw there was, a there was a workshop on Cape Cod and I was thinking, sign me up after my COVID booster shot. So I, now I'll turn things over to you, Eileen. Thank you so much, Phyllis and David for um, having me here tonight as a guest. And thank you to all of the people who came, came on to Zoom to hear the reading and especially um, happy to be reading with Anastasia Bassos, whose work I so admire. Um, I'm gonna be reading from 2 a.m. with Keats, which is basically an elegy to both Lucy Brock Broido, my dear friend, and to John Keats. Um, but be and I'll start with a poem in the book that happens before her death. Um, when I first met Lucy, she noticed there was no weather in my poetry and asked me about that. And, um, and so this uh, poem is about that. Um, when I told her about my childhood, which was quite traumatic and um, how we bonded together that night. Lucy asks me, about my childhood. In me, she divines no climate. We each take this to mean sorrow as sun glow and mauve almost define the landscape on 116th. The elms eavesdrop by the window, store legends in their veins. Lucy reaches 40 years back to cover my girl body with a quilt. Though that girl stays in her room, I rise, then venture outside into fattening clouds, a park filled with woodlands, a lake at the foot of a tower where geese walk single file to soften the wind. I notice the wind, the brilliant grass, call a few blades by their given names. Right after Lucy died, I kept looking for signs that she was with me. Elegy for Lucy. Since your last visit, I've listened for you in a screen door chain chattering against its inner window or the shift of dishes in their rack. A robin happened by to say that my looking for signs means I've once been broken. Doesn't she know? We know. I was once whole. Are you still in reach of fairies? Still bewitched? Beware. Little they worry. Little they care. A loud moon shivers. No, I shiver. Because I can't convince myself it's you. This earth is a lonely fit. The elm says grief and the oak grief and all the others other. At this exact solstice, I wish a red key to your castle, a plump tree on a short stand, gazelles at our feet. We are in an interlude. Moon goddess takes leave of the sky for Lucy. Desire, not an irritable desire. Desire as decorative rug, as red key, as ghost pumpkin. She chooses tabernacles in search of her origin. Into a plum stone, she carves 30 worlds each a mouth's tongue striking its roof, forming words for distress. 
I am afraid the sky is falling. She once caught herself tranquil near a muster of stars in a time so yestered that her body was fog, back when horses were three-toed dogs, before legends, before Luna became Lucia. Lucia winds her grandfather clock, speaks, come hither, in time with the fire, kindling thoughts, she implores, tell me. So I communed with John Keats every night at 2 a.m. for about two years, which I could do because I'm a night nurse, in an effort to reach Lucy. And in that time reading his work, I came to understand him almost like a friend and wanted to provide solace to him. Here I'm calling upon God to let kids Keats visit me in a language that John Keats would understand. Dispatch, east of sleep. Hour of winged and spectral images, wise advisor to the moss peak moon. I pray that you open the gate for John Keats to my rose walled room, that you quilt his spirit before it cools, then flood his veins to blood heat his cheeks, that he may visit in sentient molecules my unshorn minutes. Three meadows deep. And it worked, this incantation, because I did speak to John every night for two years or more. And um, each of these little, each of these nights was represented in a poem, or most of them were represented in a poem called 2 a.m. Keats Visitations. And so, um, We'll just have to understand that this occurred over a long period of time and his voice is off the page but he's somewhere in the room 2 a.m keats visitations and this is only part of the poem some some parts your apparition your apparition sings in the corner of my room then listens your ear warm and veined trained toward me how is it that you made your way to me? Are you interplanetary? Have you cut through elderberry? Lucy said she, I thought you might be, which makes this the first night of peace. The cattle at the fence breach, chew the same grasses the bay mare gnashes while I absorb what consumes you. I want to ruin the rumor that the master's dead. I know you've felt it too, death that separates you. My condolences on your silver dove. Myself, when I'm grandmother, I'll be neither wolf nor whale, but hoarfrost in still weather. Some we can't save, your mother and mine. A stick runs along a fence. No, a grasshopper sings. May fawn and sweet peas bring milder wind. Do you know one robin is a fish? Now you can write it down. Have I told you who this is for? Her father's in a drawer. Did her hair smell of rose milk? or of mint, or did you see her pass the stretch of scent? As you go on, your clouds are gray and gray, John. Don't give your view away. My canoe has tipped too much water in. Do you mind singing those last poems again? Seagulls mew and stamp their feet to mimic rain. Salt marsh mosquitoes fringe the air. A bagpipe blows over the Isle of Mull. If you can stay, stay. Don't climb the ladder through the elms. You are too pale now for the wind. 
measure how long it takes for the wax to burn so you'll know how long you've slept. I'd fill in your colors given time. I'd follow you. And this poem is for John Keats, Orphan Sky. Don't say the father died. Say night falls as if a father off a horse. Don't say the boy misses him or that the executor betrays. Say father's a pink carnation the child recalls as love, but who left him in the care of no such sorrel affection. Do not mention the mother's desertion. Zinnia says mother's soaked in sorrow, so sorry. And she's come home to die. Strike this from his memory, at least until he lodges in the quarters over the surgery where no flowers speak. Only then, as he resets the bones and closes the wounds, let him name that vacancy. Um, and I have two more poems to read. The first is Stories of Your Death. At the time that Lucy was dying, it was very hard for her to call her friends. And so she didn't want to have to tell them the news. So she was sometimes felt isolated and also um, they felt isolated. And so this is stories of your death for Lucy. It's a lie to say you died in China or that you survive in another state and commute to your tomb, that I hang willows from my gate and that we celebrate with ginger cake. Another version is truer because it's a picture book about a mute cat and her long haired mistress who keeps saying, Lucy will miss you, Nicholas. One I heard was that you were enchanted or relieved. That's blasphemy. They insist you'd wanted to stay young. Didn't hear you say you wished you'd persist. Didn't know that each time you told a friend, you had to tell yourself again. If I ever tell it, I'll mention there was ice cream. Not to sweeten your sickness but rather to show your love for lists of savers to procure. Some easy to come by, some shaved with pickled fruit. That part isn't fact. In fact, I'm ill at ease if you can't spoon dessert with me in peace. You said there is no detail that does not contain some hank of truth. This is the talk in the stark parlor where I forgive the gossips who, like me, want a stricken deer to lift itself from the road. And by that highway's ribbon of trees, there are no headlights, just sky glow as that doe roots her hooves into less terrible beauty. This last is the last. You tire of driving and we stop for tuna sandwiches. The air conditioner weeps and we bail its water. Near the end, you make us sunshine toast. Before I let you go briefly, that you were human, I celebrate with afternoon tea. So you died and I mistook your silence for taming. I can only tell you this. I've known the sky to pour flowers through the night that disappear in the sun's heat. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Eileen. We're having some silent clapping. If thank you. Can hear you. My, yeah. Thank you so much. Oh. Um, so I, one thing I, I thought I would say is that the back, the blurb on the back 
cover of your book. Um, uh, I think it says says a lot that what we just heard um, by Patrick Donnelly. Um, what a superb and deeply moving book. Every line is startlingly fresh and tender and the extreme spareness of the poems is strange in the most necessary way. And then in parentheses, strange, always being the highest compliment I could give any work of art. So Thank you. I just love that. And it reminds Thank you me, so much. you're welcome. Yeah, it reminds me of a discussion we were just having this morning about in our poetry uh, group about um, strangeness and how it is really what we strive for. So I think you've got it, yeah. <laughs> so is that something that you, I'll just ask you really briefly now, is that something that you strive for? Or is it just kind of come out that way? Um, I, I probably um, come by the strangeness, honestly, without too much trying. <laughs> um, uh, but I think that that's what happens when we dip into our subconscious, that the um, deep inner individualism comes through. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a couple of comments in the chat. Um, so beautiful, um, Kathy says, and Renee says, love the slant rhymes, <clears throat> which I didn't even notice because I was so busy taking it in, but they're there and that's, it's even better when you don't notice them, I think, when they're not, when they just kind of happen. Yeah, that's um, true. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm just wondering, Anne, do you want to say anything before we go on to yours? To, um, in response yeah, to Eileen's um, a beautiful, a beautiful reading. Um, I remember uh, a conversation with a group of poets at a reading that Patrick Donnelly did for Lily Poetry Salon. And the topic came up. The question came to Patrick during the Q&A. Patrick, what are your obsessions? And his obsession at the time was Maria Callas and his book, uh, Little Known Operas, I think is the title. Um, mm -hmm. So we were talking about that. And then he turned the question on the group. What are some of your obsessions? And Eileen told us that she was obsessed with John Keats and that she spoke to him every night. And, um, <laughs> and when her book came out, it was almost like I felt like I was there when it was born or something. Do you know what I mean? I felt an, an intimacy with the, mm -hmm. with the, with the title and, uh, and with the book. Um, I've read the book. I've read 2 a.m. with Keith a few times. And the first time I read it, it was rather, it felt a little disjointed. And then the more I read it, I see where the anchors are. Um, for, the, for me to, to hold on to. Um, the, poem, uh, the poem where the speaker speaks to John Keats, the way it appears on the page has parentheses, which I think are how, um, which I think are sort of meant to be John Keats' response to what the speaker is, is saying. And, what I found really uh, interesting about that was what could possibly be contained within those parentheses and imagining that as I read, as I read the poem, I thought that was really, um, that was really wonderful. I'm wondering, so here's a page of it. If you can see, you know, there's like little parentheses there. Um, That's the next book, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful, uh, beautiful <laughs> reading, Eileen. You did a beautiful job. Oh, thank, thank you, you so thanks, much. Anna. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Forward to hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. So okay. So let me introduce Anastasia, so we can hear you. Um, let's see. So um, so Anastasia has poems appearing in Rhino, Swim, Rust and Maw, Thrush Poetry. Comstack Review and others. Um, and let's see her poems, End of Life Directive and Self-Portrait as Lot's Wife, received honorable mention from Marge Piercy in a, in a contest. Um, 
And let's see, she also has another poem that was named Poet, Poem of the Moment, that's cool, on masspoetry.org. She's author of Nike, Nike Adjusting Her Sandal, Nix's Mate uh, of this year. Um, and she's a Best of the Net finalist. Um, that's pretty, that's a pretty cool thing. Um, she's a reader for Lily Poetry Review, speaks three languages, and I want to know the third, what the third one is. Um, and she's not only that, all of that, but she's a long distance cyclist, and we're talking long distance. Um, she lives in Boston, as does Eileen. Um, and, and Anastasia and I are, uh, there's some, a few people here actually now who know about this already because they're in it too. It's, uh, we're in a poetry crafting group together. Um, uh, so, um, and, and I guess you know Marge Piercy, so we can talk about that later if you want. Okay, so please jump right in. Okay, thanks, I, I, uh, thanks Phyllis. Um, well, as, uh, as Phyllis said, my book is, is uh, Nike Adjusting Her Sandal. And it's a, an exploration really of dual cultures. Um, many of the poems and images uh, explore Greek culture and some Greek myths and, and Greek characters, but it's also about um, the speaker's uh, experience of growing up in the American Midwest and how that, uh, how that contrast is straddled. Um, so I'll start with Thessaloniki, 4 a.m. Here they dance with arms raised above their heads, the middle of the body suspended like a question. They bend their knees as their feet describe the arc of some forgotten journey. I've been up all night drinking ouzo. My plane leaves in an hour that a bet the got pulses in my veins. I have an exquisite headache. I'm in love with the city of dusty streets and ancient churches. For now, it is I on this empty road, the car radio, my only cohort. Metallic strains of buzuki seep through the air like the thick smoke of a gold was, even the sardine fishermen sleep. The heat has begun to settle a blanket. When the sun comes up, I'll be gone. 3,000 ancestors ask how I straddle the sea, a foot on either shore. I peer through the window at Orion's belt in search of home. The three sisters are the stars that shine in the middle. I race through the dark, speaking in tongues. Um, the island of Santorini is named as Thera by the Greeks. And um, it was the site of an ancient Minoan civilization and a volcano erupted there. And so today when one goes to Santorini, uh, you can see sort of the remains of household goods and homes and so forth, but there are no human remains. So there's some speculation among researchers that somehow the inhabitants of the island had warning before the volcano erupted and were able to escape. Uh, and there's a legend that uh, Santorini or Thera is the lost island of Atlantis. On Thera, on this white island ringed in blue and dust, we climb ghost steps leading up out of the cauldron. You and I are Greeks today, pretending we're on the surface of the moon. A widow dressed in black guards the church. Here at the edge of the Aegean, she tells us there's more wine than water, more churches than houses, more donkeys than people. Feed me a country that curves rogue waves round its edge, then returns them. I thirst, I hunger baffled crater, caldera, caldaria. Language laces my Greek tongue with the lips of a Spaniard. We're at the hem of the volcano. I lift my dress, the breeze on my legs. 
another island uh, in Greece is the island of Tinos, and it's considered a holy island in the Aegean. A miracle occurred there with an icon of the Virgin Mary, and there's a church at the top of the hill um, that honors the Virgin Mary, where pilgrims come from around Greece to pray to uh, the Virgin Mary for the healing of the sick. And they begin their pilgrimage to the church on their hands and knees down at the harbor and climb the hill to the, uh, to the church. So this is about that. Tinos, August 2012. The island holds dust like a bowl, but not for long. When the wind cracks, the sand snakes, the priest's shutters are open. The rooster blusters the morning sun. In the center of this powdery town, a modern day Sisyphus ascends to the Virgin Mary's church on hands and knees, the bone he has to pick with God between his teeth. Dust in his lungs, his coarse face is flooded blood hot. A scrim of heat rises off his back like a mirage. We walk the sandy roads hand in hand and observe the sacred contour. We stop for bread, tomatoes, cheese, a bottle of water. We bow our heads, having never been hungry. Portrait of mother on the Greek peninsula. The yellow ladder leaned against the white house gleaming. The blue swallow tilted and swerved in cursive against the bluest sky. That was the summer you had the best idea. The summer you laid the hose out in the sun so we'd have hot water. On the simmering beach, you sat with your hat on your head in the doubtful shade of the rusty umbrella. You sat next to your sister on the crisp edge of the sea, watching the sea, watching my sister and me swim in the bluest sea. You sat on the shimmering beach. I, sam, I swam in the bluest sea with my sister. The summer you had the best idea. We picked kumquats from trees that lined the garden like old time Greek soldiers in layered skirts. Ate kumquats while baby swallows curled their tongues around songs. The sun was so hot we could have melted butter on stones at sunrise. We laid out the garden hose for water hot enough to wash off the salt, the sand from the simmering beach. The best idea. Your hat on your head, you washed my shirt till it was whiter than white in the hottest sun. Ironed my shirt to its crispest edge, as white as the house that held the yellowest ladder that leaned against it, gleaming. You were the best that summer. I remember that summer as if it were just now, like the answer to a question leaning in a doorway. Okay, so now we'll travel to the Midwest. Thank you. Self-portrait is Jane Kenyon. It's the end of May. The sun rises late here in the Midwest as I did this morning, mother still sleeps. I will wake her soon. Caring for her these days is like trying to carry water in my palm over a long distance. When she's gone, I'll wish for these days back. The sky started out blue, but the islands that were clouds now cling to one another and portend rain. Nature upturns herself. So be it. The ground is as dry and cracked as an old woman's skin. Three birds sing, a tree waves, cool wind from the west. Driving to Lake Erie on mother's 97th birthday. The late October light has weakened my resolve for heroism. Mother and I drive east, the lake to our west, its furthest coast, another country. To our right, maple leaf cinders singe the sidewalk's gray vestiges, leave scars. 
A lonely teenager rakes the clamorous debris. Her red hair drowns her shoulders. Over our heads, the clouds hold their convocation and the sparrows have gathered their tribe. Now a hundred arrows released and turned by the wind. Mother curves her head. She hears, but does not see. If I didn't know better, I'd say when it's time to die, face north. The light remains constant there. Prodigal daughter. Um, my father owned a candy store when my sister and I were growing up. And uh, well, that's all I'll say about it. Everybody thought we were the luckiest kids in town. And in many ways we were. Prodigal daughter, he stood, poured his tea from one cup to another to cool so he could drink it before he walked to the corner of the street to catch a bus that took him to the train to walk another block to catch another bus and then walk to his store so that my sister and I could go to college. I paid my father back by telling him I didn't believe in God. That was the summer I memorized Yates as I rode the train to work in town. I stared at the outlines of trees against the sky's coat. He called me princess. He faltered into the chair next to the phone on the wall. He said, that's a sin, you know, and I, in my know-it-allness with my college education, was indifferent until my mother told me he had cried. I had been thinking about Petrarchan sonnets and that I had run out of cigarettes. Um, oh, well, thanks again. Phyllis and everybody for attending uh, this. I'm going to read two more poems and I'm going to read the po uh, Nike adjusting her sandal. There are two poems in the collection with that title. Um, this is uh, a picture of the sculpture and uh, it was in the temple of Athena Nike on the Acropolis and now it's in the, in the Acropolis Museum in Athens. And I think it's one of the most beautiful uh, in ancient sculpture. Um, I played with two notions for these two very different poems. The first was Plato's allegory of the cave. Um, he saw the human race chained uh, in a cave as prisoners, the shadowed images of people behind them pacing back and forth as firelight cast the reflections on the wall before the prisoners. So what the prisoners see is a version of reality, but not reality itself. So I played with that idea in one of the poems. And the other poem plays with just simply the beauty of the Greek sculpture, how marble is rendered as soft folds of fabric, how the body emerges underneath, how it looks like water and the play of light and shadow. Nike adjusting her sandal. It was Plato who did not say but surely reflected, shadows conscript the sun to show true form. You stop breathless, water folds down the front of your body, the dim fabric of a chitin, you balance on one leg. How light creates folds across her dress, a water shimmer, a shiver, trick of the eye, unadorned, exquisite. Time wrinkles, ages passing, a narrow road of shade amid the gladness of riot light. She steps across one poem at a time, her feet wet with words, the subtle harmony of some unknown thing. Thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you, Anastasia. It's just beautiful. Let me, let me, um, oh, actually, uh, why doesn't everybody unmute now? 
go ahead and um, we'll talk. So I'll just read some of what's in the um, chat here. People um, were putting in some of their favorite lines. Um, uh, let's see, the sparrows have gathered their tribe, uh, swerved in cursive against the bluest sky of the bone. He has to pick with God between his teeth. So poignant, gorgeous, water shiver. That was for the one about your dad. Um, her mm -hmm. feet wet with words. Um, the subtle harmony of some unknown thing. Oh, so lovely. And then we have a comment. Thank you bo to both of these wonderful readers from Amanda. So good to hear your work aloud. I agree. Uh, so, so I really want to encourage people to participate if you feel like you want to. And maybe uh, since Anne had uh, commented about your reading a little bit, Eileen, maybe you could say a few things about hers to get started. And sure, absolutely. Yeah, well, one of the things that I most appreciate, well, not one of the things, but a few of the things that I most appreciate about Anastasia's book and her poetry are um, not only the way um, the poems place us in a setting, but how each poem becomes like a um, sort of like engraved in images and um, they're so very clear yet sophisticated. And I just wonder, um, you know, there's a, there, that poem about um, the father was so poignant. I don't know if I had heard that read aloud before. Um, but I know this is a lot to ask, but I wondered if you would consider reading that again for us, Anna. Be fine. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. Prodigal daughter, right? Prodigal mm -hmm. daughter. <laughs> he stood, poured his tea from one cup to another to cool so he could drink it before he walked to the corner of the street to catch a bus that took him to the train to walk another block to catch another bus and then walk to a store so that my sister and I could go to college. I paid my father back by telling him I didn't believe in God. That was the summer I memorized Yates as I rode the train to work in town. I stared at the outlines of trees against the sky's coat. He called me princess. He faltered onto the chair next to the phone on the wall. He said, that's a sin, you know, and I and my know-it-allness with my college education was indifferent until my mother told me he cried. I had been thinking about Petrarch and Sonnet and that I had run out of cigarettes. Yeah, I think um, that's so lovely. And I think out of all the beautiful things in that poem, of course, the, um, the acceptance of the self at that time and, and realizing the impact of how our our thoughts and behaviors affect people when we're young. That of course is beautiful. But what really struck me is how um, your father lives again in this poem by the simple act of pouring uh, coffee from one cup to another to cool it off and calling you princess. You know, those details that only you would know. And that reminds me of, um, you know, something Richard Hugo says, which is, or said, which is that um, the poems that are uniquely our own, that only we have included something that only we would know that would put access to the humans within the poem are what stick with us. And so that image of your father pouring the coffee from one cup to another is, is very poignant. Thank you for those poems. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you for that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if anybody has a question um, that you'd like to ask either one of our poets. Um, I wonder if I could uh, reveal that I couldn't tell who, who, which poet said this, but someone said it was so hot that morning that uh, the butter melted into the scones just sitting on the sidewalk or something. Who's that was Anastasia, yeah. That was Anastasia. Would you repeat that little thing? <laughs> that stopped me, and I couldn't think of anything else because I'm feeling a little hot right here. It's only 76 <laughs> or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, here, this part is you know, if you do purchase the book, then you will have that image forever. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Good point. Uh, let's see. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Okay. I'll just read that. The sun was so hot. You want me? To, you just want me to read that part, right? Yeah, just that part. That's what stuck stuck me. The, the sun was so hot we could have melted butter on stone. At sunrise, we laid out the garden hose for water hot enough to wash off the salt and sand from the shimmering beach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's pretty effective. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I like, now, now, is your book? Uh, published by Nix's mate, is that? It was, and uh, Eileen and I had the pleasure of sort of being in the same graduating class, if you will. Nix's mate, uh, our books were both uh, launched in April of 2021. So that was, you know, that That's was lovely. I mean, for me, for me, you know, oh, so this publisher accepted my book. Well, wow, he accepted Eileen Cleary too. So it must, I must, be okay <laughs> if I'm yes. in the company of someone like Eileen. I mean, that's how I felt. That's a very interesting sight, and uh, I I think there are three. It's a triad of uh, editors, and one is, of course, McGinnis, uh, Michael McGinnis, isn't it? Yes. I remember him from years ago. He, oh he, goodness. He published with, uh, I think it was called Primitive. He published a book of mine in the 80s. And so, and I've kept up with it. He was a young fellow. And when I went to visit Boston, I went to visit him in Alston. And uh, he has had quite a, a fine life, I think, a difficult life. And then he's got these two co editors, co publishers. And when I saw Nix's mate, I thought, ah, hmm, that's something. Yeah. Um I think Eileen will agree with me that he was a, a a wonderful person to publish with, easygoing, um, accepted all my edits over and over, and gave me the book I wanted, gave me the cover I wanted, um, everything, you know, and produced some beautiful, you know, there were three of us who were published at once, um, but certainly I know I, I you know, Eileen's cover is beautiful. The book is beautiful. Um, you know, there was something I wanted to say about Eileen's, um, Eileen's work, and that was, uh, Eileen, you read a book, The Elegy for Lucy. I think you began with that. And the poem, there are there are these three and four line stanzas and couplets, and they are each on their own page. And the impact of that to give the reader some space, you know, because these images are so vivid and so specific and so grounded in this world, um, that that white space around the imagery really gives the reader, uh, the ability, for me, for this reader, the ability to kind of feel the spiritual impact of it, if you will. You know, I, I thought that that was a beautiful, a beautiful gesture in, um, in how the book was laid out. Yeah, I had asked Michael um, for the white space because um, it's sort of like, 
if you were at a wake or a memorial service, you would need time to step into a quiet room before continuing a conversation. It's sort of like that time to really um, kind of absorb things and maybe not have something bombard you. So thank you for noticing yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I one one of the things that I oh I did want to mention something about the hose because when I read that poem, Anastasia, I it really um it, it made me smile because um just lately uh I started a garden in, in our backyard and um and uh, I didn't realize that the water got so hot in the hose <laughs> and I practically <laughs> killed a little plant. <laughs> so oh, no. so it's, really, it's really, uh, it was so funny when you wrote that because um, I could see how you could turn that into a, a you know, a shower. And it is such a lovely you know, thing for a mother to do, yeah, to figure that out. Um, but it's not like she figured it out. There was a point in her childhood where that was how she got hot water. Oh, you know right. okay that, uh -huh. right she grew up she she grew up in in Greece but she was born and spent the first few years of her life on this little island in Turkey that's inhabited by like you know 20 people today um wow. and uh so it wasn't it wasn't like she thought of it it was just that's how she once heated the water before she had it at her fingertips, you know, it was, yeah. And yeah. now, you know, now we stand there and wait for the hot water to go flow out of the hose so we can get to the cold <laughs> water. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and then I did want to, I did want to mention more about um, some of, I mean, some of your, um, the, the, the ways that you put words together, which uh, it is, um, and also the way that you put them on the page, as Anne was talking about. Um, so I came up with a few examples, um, uh, and then maybe you could talk a little more about it. Um, so I have what I have so far is her father's in a drawer, mm -hmm. which I thought that was just so intriguing to me. Was that his ashes in a drawer? That's what came to me. But and then uh, don't give your view away. Like that's. That's interesting. Um, so, is that talking to somebody who just died, and um, they're they're uh, buried, and they have a certain view that um, I don't know? But anyway, I, I really did love that. How, how can we say whose rain it is? Um, think of me as a cow grazing your breath. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then the, the, the last one, which um, uh, you, that I have written down here at the end of the, uh, the poem, for one of the poems for Lucy, near the end, you made us sunshine toast. Um, that's just so beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I can speak to some of that. Mm -hmm. um, so when I asked John Keats, you know, do you know who this is for, which is who is this poem for, her father's in a drawer. It is a direct reference to Lucy Brock Broido's poem, Father in a Drawer, oh, okay. which um, came about because she opened a drawer and um, a photo of her father was in the drawer. And um, she, you know, she and her sister Julie kind of talked about their father in a drawer, like just as, you know, you know, how you might with a sister. And um, so it was after her father had died. So she had written the poem, Father Under Draw, which you could probably find on the Poetry mm -hmm. Foundation. And who can say whose reign it is, mm -hmm. just kind of refers to the fact that it kind of goes back to that, the poem Lucy asked me about my childhood because um, there was a time in my life growing up where I was very isolated and we were very poor and didn't leave home very often, really didn't leave our room very often um, at one point. And it became almost like the outside didn't, world didn't belong to us anymore. 
And so, so and it, that became such a um, overriding idea without my even knowing it, mm. that it wasn't until many decades later, I mean, after I raised children and a long time in my career, that I did not realize I still didn't consider the outdoors as belonging to me, even though I would go visit it frequently, like every day. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when I, when Lucy was reading my poems, she said, I noticed there's no weather in your poems. I noticed there's not a lot of outdoors in your poem. And that's when we started talking about my childhood. And that's when I told her I really didn't feel like the outdoors belonged to me, that I was qualified or capable or to write anything about anything outside of in the air. <laughs> and um, that's when I finally realized um that the rain and the outdoors really doesn't belong to anyone and that we're all part of this system. And it changed my poetry and it changed my point of view and it gave the world back to me. And so that's kind of what that question means, who, who can say whose rain it is. That was really beautiful to hear you oh. talk about it. Um, and well, also uh, to, um, oh, does someone else want to talk? I no, I'm just so impressed by, you know, the, the, the source of, of where this comes from, the, you know, the, the yes. depth of the depth of where it, you know, where it stems from yeah. the, that the outdoor is not belonging and to Eileen and then realizing much later in life that it does. I think, I think that, uh, you know, there, there are numerous people who have that in their lives. I know I had it in my life for, um, uh, with people, I didn't think other people, I, I deserved to talk to other people until, you know, way after I was in high school. Mm -hmm. So I didn't talk to people. Wow. And, and uh, so, yeah, I must write about that. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, you really must. Yeah, uh, yeah. you must. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I and I'm so glad that um, you're not holding that belief anymore. Thank you for sharing. Oh, that. I. Yeah, I, I I overcame that with, you know, great difficulty and 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 very dear people who reached out to me and pulled me out of that that. Uh, a lonely place that I was living in. Mm. Yeah. We're glad to hear that for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to read about it. You please well, sh send that to me when you're done. Oh, I'll absolutely. Do. I will. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for, for talking about that. Yeah. And anyone else? I mean, that, um, it just makes me think about the depth, the richness of yeah. how poetry works that you know, you write it, you know what you're writing about, maybe to some extent, some extent it's magical. You don't even really know what you're writing about. It just comes out of you. And then there's so many ways that we can receive it. Um, so it has a meaning that could be, that could take on so many different, so many other meanings. Um, Phyllis, there's yeah. a, um, I noticed in the chat, there's a question for Eileen. Um, oh, thank and you. I, can't I, I don't I'm yeah. covering the chat up with my question document. I, ah, I don't mind reading it. I Please don't mind do. reading it. It's from Gray. Yeah, go ahead. I keep picturing you at 2 a.m. coming home from work and talking to Keith. Did you have a ritual for conjuring him? It's such a striking image to think of you at that time of night in communion with Keith. It seems so intimate and private. Oh, thank you for that question um yeah I mean I it's interesting because I wasn't always home at 2 a.m sometimes I was on the side of the road or um I was in the hospice office um and sometimes I was in my room and every every night at 2 a.m I did 
I was awake and I was starting with a prayer and reading his books and reading his biography. And um, to me, communing with people is very important, whether they're alive or dead. And a lot of it has to do with thinking about them and what they say and what they leave us. And um, so, yeah, I would pray to him. I would not pray to him as if he were a God, but pray to God that he would hear me. And I would ask him, I would try to offer him solace for everything he had been through. And I would, I don't know, invite him. And it, it felt very real. Um, but the big thing was that it happened every night no matter where I was or what I was doing. It, and every it, once in a while, he comes unbidden. Yeah. Now. He feels more welcome. It feels almost like backwards healing, Eileen, to heal Keats in that way. And also forwards healing. It must have been healing for you as well. It's just, a, it's just these two time periods, you know, coming together and, and uh, yeah. It, sees, it feels healing just listening to it. You talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So here's another question in the chat for, um, for yeah. Anastasia, from Missy. I have a question for Anastasia. In Thelis <laughs> Lachany, okay, you can correct me on that, 4 a.m., there is a line about ancestors asking how you straddle the sea a foot on either shore. Can you speak to how your Greek heritage and American upbringing influences your poetry or what that means to you? Uh, yeah, uh, it's the Saloniki. Thank you, for Saloniki. Yeah. Um, well, one way, and I focused on this a little more um, in, recent in recent poems the poems that appear in in my book nike adjusting your sandal were written five or six years ago so you know the work has changed quite a bit since then you know sometimes i look at my book and i say oh if i were in a workshop these are the comments <laughs> i'd give this poet <laughs> yeah be that as it may um one way is in a real fascination with with uh with language and etymology because I keep coming across words, you know, like I was riding my bike one day into Concord and there's a famous cemetery uh, that you pass on the right as you, as, you, as you crest the hill. And I saw the word cemetery and I realized it's kimitirio, which means a place to sleep in Greek. And it's like every word I, you know, it's like in that movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. You, you tell me a word and I will give you its Greek word, root. So, so uh, words and etymology is one way that I explore that. Um, the other thing is that there's such a, uh, there's such a, um, I wanna say tension, but it's a, 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 a vibration between, you know, growing up with parents who were Greek and speaking another language and, you know, growing up in a Catholic neighborhood where the kids were very different. And, you know, we would go on picnics and the people who were at the, who were like in the other picnic area next to us were having hot dogs and hamburgers and we were having stuffed grape leaves and feta cheese and choriatiki uh, salad and, um, and wanting to be American, but also being so uh, in, uh, entrenched in in uh, the Greek the Greek community. So it's interesting about that line about the ancestors uh, asking how I straddle the sea a foot on either shore. The poem originally did not have that couplet in it about that, and somebody said to me in a workshop, "You need to." there needs to be something about the connection between the two. So I threw in that couplet and it's very interesting to me. It's very interesting to me how people very often comment on how that 
that moment in the poem strikes them, how, how meaning, how it resonates, how it resonates for them. Did I answer your question? I, yeah, I, 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 may I uh, just say, uh, I, what, what came to my mind with that line, uh, straddle the sea a foot on either shore, I, I, what came to my mind was the Colossus of Rhodes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. With the foot on either shore, straddling, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a heroic image, isn't it? Yes, yeah it, yeah. it it becomes a heroic image, so that in fact, it's like the speaker sort of makes claim to, I can do this, you know, here right. makes that statement, makes that claim. Right. And the Colossus also fell into the sea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, there's another yeah. layer of metaphor. <laughs> It's interesting sometimes when I when I write a poem, I really sometimes I don't see how it resonates until it's written or I read it, you know, a few times or I read it a month later and then I say, Wow, well this connects to that and it has this layer of meaning that I wasn't aware of at the time at the time I wrote it. That's kind of the magic of the creative process, I think, of being a poet. Right. Is you learn stuff about yourself that you didn't know and you write it down and then there it is. And, and, and it's sort of like the poem becomes your teacher in a way. Right, Eileen, do you agree? I completely agree. Yeah. Hmm. Perfect answer from Misty, yeah. So what else, yeah? Other questions or comments or? Okay, I have. Oh, I wanna, I just wanna say, um, you know, you didn't have a copy of your, of your uh, book handy to show us the cover of Phyllis, but um, Phyllis wrote a wonderful book called The Full Moon Herald. There it is. Oh, there it is. <laughs> and it's like, and it's the news of the day in poetry form and what I admire about that collection is that I'm still trying to figure out how to write about current events mm -hmm. in poetry and uh, Phyllis accomplishes that so beautifully and she tackles everything that we're thinking about and dealing with these days so it's a wonderful it's a wonderful mm -hmm. collection thank you thanks for saying that yeah mm -hmm. So let's see, so um, how's our energy? I just wanna check in um, with people in terms of, um, do you want more? Um, are there more questions? I certainly have more questions. I just wanna see where the energy of the, of the room is, of our collected room. <laughs> um, I, I, need to, I need to sign off because I have a- That's, that's I have an, another engagement to go to, mm -hmm. uh, so I very reluctantly and with a sad heart, I need to say goodbye to everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Eileen, Anastasia. I absolutely love hearing your your readings and your work, and and thank you so much, Phyllis, for 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 You're having welcome. having me having us. Mm, thank thank you. you for coming. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for coming, Erica. Bye. So, you know, sometimes what I notice with um, doing readings on Zoom is somebody wants to say something, but it just takes a while to feel like you can, um, you know, figure out how to, when to do it or how to do it. Oh, here's a question for Eileen. Um, to what extent does being a hospice nurse influence your poetry? Her wonderful question. Um, I think it probably greatly influences my poetry um, because it just greatly influences my life. Um, and mostly, I think, um, I don't consider, I mean, I mostly that I think about the afterlife and the spiritual 
what remains of a person on earth after they leave and the impact they've had. I think I think a lot about that and the life cycle and that sort of thing. I can't really say until like Anastasia, I read my poems later, but I think I think it greatly affects my work certainly affects my work with poets and with editing um, because I look at um, each poem that's submitted to my journal or each book that's submitted to my press and I think to myself what legacy can I help this poet leave what what words, what uh, of all the words I've read today, which are the most, most need to be said, which most need to be printed and left behind. Oh, that's beautiful. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I will also, I, I would, I just want to comment too on that in that, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm a reader for Lily Poetry Review, but um, I also took a workshop on revision with Eileen recently, and her um, how she's so intuitive in the she's so intuitive. I don't I I don't know what else, how else to say it, but she. She talked about my poems in a way that kind of open space in them for me to look at them differently. And uh, I don't know, I, I felt like I just had to say that because you were talking about, mm -hmm. about editing poems and maybe that has to do with your work as a, as a hospice nurse and uh, the, kind of, um, the kind of deep kindness and compassion it takes to do that work. Oh, thanks. I mean, yeah. I think it's, um, although that might be true, I think um, it was an honor to enter into your work, Anna. Okay. There was so much to enter into. You left so many doors and windows there. It was quite easy to enter into mm -hmm. and it was a joy. You know, when you say that about your legacy, it um, it does seem like a lot of us are older. You know, at, at, um, I know for me, I started I started writing quite a while ago, but I really didn't get into it at really seriously until I was older. And uh, so that does, it, and you, you look around sometimes at the readings we're having on Zoom and in at, in person too, and a lot of us are older. So Maybe there is something about that, that we're trying, you know, not everybody, of course, but um, we're trying to figure that out. It, and I find it comforting. I really do. This idea that, you know, well, um, okay, so what's left behind? Well, okay, so some people leave words behind or art or music or, and that that's got to mean something, you know, because it, it can feel so insignificant in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you know, Phyllis, I think too, it's sort of like one beautiful thing, and I'd love to hear how other people feel about this, about poetry in particular, um, although you could be said about other writing, but, you know, I was talking to John Keats, who wasn't here for a few centuries in this form right mm -hmm. and the thing about it is without us knowing it we are all talking to one another across countries across centuries across across the lawn if our neighbor happens to be a poet but um it's we have entered this huge conversation this conversation we're all kind of communing with one another and whether we know it or not, um, whether we're listening to the other poets or not. Um, and it's timeless and beautiful. And so I think that's one of the things that most excites me with 
I think is most beautiful about poetry and anyone here in the audience who writes we're 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 writing across the centuries we don't know what will be left and who will read what we've said and we don't know from the poems we've read before how we're responding to them either these days or years later but it's very affecting to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you feel about that, Anna? Mm -hmm. Well, I feel as you, I feel as you do. Um, I think sometimes people, when something dramatic happens in people's lives or out in the world, someone will say, oh, no words. There are no words to describe this. And I always say in the back of my mind, oh yes, there are, sure there are. <laughs> There's millions of words. Um, and I think that, um, I think that certainly as we age, there comes an understanding of our, the wisdom of, of what we've learned as we've gone through life and there's also the sense of that most precious commodity, time running out and wanting to make the most of it. And, um, you know, I write every day and, and I, I write hundreds of poems and most of them stay in my notebook and don't see the light of day, but I sort of feel that urgency. And now that I have the time to do it, um, it's really important to me. It's important to me. Yeah. It's vital. So I would like to um, bring Perry Longo into this conversation. I don't know if you were thinking about our connection that way, Perry. Um, I was, and I've been sitting here thinking about all kinds of things. And yeah. um, everyone else can you hear me okay yeah yeah so everyone yeah, i've known yeah. phyllis for many many years we met each other in the poetry therapy association some years ago um and what brought me to poetry and phyllis probably and she can correct me if i'm wrong is how healing it is to our psyche to be able to find the words and have the confidence to express our words in any way that they come out. And I was thinking today, listening to both of you, Eileen and Anastasia, how much I was writing down things that you said that were, I heard that were very important to me. And we were talking to each other across centuries, even doing that. And what a great idea it was for Phyllis to start this reading. <laughs> and having a conversation because all the poems that I've heard on um, the times that I have come onto this reading and the discussions have um, definitely enriched not only my heart and my mind, but given me ideas to write about. Um, I work in the hospice environment and I've been running a poetry writing group for the bereaved in the hospice in Santa Barbara for many years. And people come into that group never having, most of them even read poetry. Um, they just heard, they just hear it's a good group, you know. So they come in and I was talking with a, with a friend about this the other day. They write these amazing poems, knowing nothing about it because I bring in these wonderful poems like from Keats or Yeats or Shakespeare, or um, Alberto Rios, or, or whoever, uh, in different cultures, different generations. And these words speak to them, and it opens their, their heart, and they write these poems that are so wonderful that, um, uh, you know, certainly j just put me back on my heels. And it lets me know that when the heart is open, almost anybody can really write. Mm -hmm. and and 
uh, grief and the world is in a state of grief now for so many reasons. And uh, almost anybody can write if, if someone is there and saying, you know, that's, that someone across the ages or the continents or next door writes something that, that penetrates the heart that they can relate to. And Phyllis, I just, I wrote a blurb for Phyllis's book and how wonderful her book is. And um, I think it's just so great, this reading. And I love hearing all of you and your comments. And, and so thank you, Phyllis and, and mm -hmm. Eileen and Anastasia. Anastasia, I had a question from you. I was raised in the Midwest um, in Wisconsin. And um, I, don't, I never met anybody who was Greek in my life in the Midwest. And I was wondering what the Midwest was like for you uh, living in the Midwest when your culture was so different from any other culture in most of the Midwest, as far as I know. Well, I grew up in a huge Greek community in Cleveland, oh. Ohio. Oh. So, uh, and my father lived for a number of years in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, before he moved to Cleveland. Um, so, you know, as a kid, you want to be kind of like in with your peers and um, uh, uh, be, be one of them. But on the other hand, I knew so many Greek people and was surrounded by them all the time. It wasn't like it was a strange it wasn't like it was a strange thing or we were the only Greek family. You know, my uncle lived next door, my other and his family, my other uncle and their cousins lived, you know, a few streets down. So um, we had a very robust, a robust community. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, so you know what, I'm just wondering, given the time that we're at, does each of you have a poem to take us out, a short poem that we could end with? Did sure. I ask you for that before or? Could I ask Anna to go first? Will I search for mine? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see, okay, so this, uh, one of the books of poetry that I love is Ann Carson's Fragments of Sappho. And so this poem is, uh, is titled, The Modern Poet Tries to Read Sappho in Ancient Greek. There's Greek on one page and her translation on the other page. So I can read both. Um, and sprinkled in between my fragments, the modern poet's fragments are Sappho's fragments. The modern poet tries to read Sappho in ancient Greek. Yes, on a soft bed, one cycladic beckon, found, not found, yearns her virginity, oh, for Adonis, liar, necessary limb, bride with beautiful feet, pearls unstrung, Orpheus, ungrounded, decoded, imaginal, Smears, hands dip, yes, language, lingual, languor, linger, lost, soft, ah, ah, Sappho. Stand to face me, beloved, and open out the grace of your eyes. And so, sensate dream and these fingertips, and on these eyes, yes, black sleep of night. Words linger now, yes tongue, lips, bloom on ear. May you sleep on the breast of your delicate friend. Oh, thank you. And what is your third language? Just briefly. French. Oh, uh, French. I was, yeah. Even and the French fourth one is Pig Latin. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, Eileen, yeah, you're going to take us out. Okay, I'm going to read a poem called Homecoming. Good. Perfect. Six million years past this life, past every child borrowed by any mother, past metamorphic rock that bakes itself into centuries, past hunter-gatherers 
and pre-literate brains that struck the first unhappy man who squabbled with his soul. Past language arriving at any nation at the point of a sword. Hope pilots eternity past this morning and the mountain beyond past four seconds of wind that bends that mountain's shouldered grass past sorrow melting into itself as seamlessly as glass oh beautiful thank you so much yeah and thanks yeah thanks to everybody who has been here and is still here um, I wish we could go on for longer, but I think we've kind of come to the end of our allotted time. So, um, so uh, yeah, what do I say? I'm kind of um, just blown away at the moment. <laughs> so we'll end Thank you, that. Phyllis. Oh, you're Thank welcome. you so much. Thanks, you're all welcome. of you, so much. Thank you, so, Anna. Thank you. So thank we'll you both, and Phyllis. Thank you.